Welcome. It has been a, a very long day um, with a lot of parallel uh, scientific sessions. And uh, we really hope that you have enjoyed the program so far. I'm very, very glad today to welcome Steve Jarrett to conclude this fantastic day. Uh, so Steve has been a, a product leader and an entrepreneur in AI and mobile networks for over 25 years, including building one of the first Facebook, uh, I should say now Meta probably, first strategic machine learning programs back in 2013. He has worked with Apple on the original iPod, and he has been product manager for the very first mobile browser at General Magic. Uh, Steve has also been founding um, CEO of three software companies in the US and UK. But Steve now is the um, senior vice president of data and, and AI at Orange Innovation. Um, and at Orange, um, he has taken responsibility for a new data and artificial intelligence department defining the, the, the group's data strategy. This new organization consolidates the key skills to help the company develop use cases to enrich services and to improve processes based on data and artificial intelligence, as well as to enhance the value of this data, of this data externally. So let's welcome Steve to talk about how to break silos and build a data democracy. Raphael, thank you so much for the introduction. It's great to be here. And let's see if I can share my screen. And how does that look? Perfect. Okay, great. So, so what I thought I wanted to talk to you about today is not only our vision for AI, and, but also the challenges that we see and to talk you through some use cases that we think are potentially interesting that may be relevant for you. And then I wanted to leave time for questions as well. So I look forward to those. So um, at, at Orange, you know, my favorite definition of AI is, is the science of making machines smarter and by automating tasks normally done by people. And if you look back historically, Leda Ada Lovelace in England, you know, she was really the first programmer. It, it was her working with Charles Babbage's uh, machine. And she had the, the mental breakthrough that could you give a machine a list of instructions that it could follow? And, and so could we create the machines in the future that could follow any instructions that a human could give it? Uh, and then it was in the 50s, Alan Turing, uh, his, his next step that really was the birth of AI was about uh, maybe later Ada Lovelace wasn't thinking broad enough. Maybe, maybe there was an opportunity to create machines that could actually think as humans without having to give them explicit uh, lists of steps. And so if you think about that in the context of business, uh, the, the AI, uh, the opportunity is for AI to be in everything. And, and one of the metaphors I like to use is that, imagine what it was like to run a business before Excel existed, where you had to use an abacus to try to compute things. And whereas with Excel, you have this incredible ability to gather information, structure it, do projections, do visualizations, and, and, and really that's how we think about AI at Orange, is that these tools are gonna to enable us to have kind of superpowers in our daily job. And so the, the idea is that our vision for AI is it's not just improving the lives of people, our customers, but also people at Orange, at our own employees. But one of the reasons why I'm so proud to work at the company is that we really take a broader view, and we take very seriously the impact that our work um, can have on society, but also um, on our planet, because uh, we need to not only, we need to be able to deliver these great experiences, uh, deliver communications to people, enable them to learn and to keep in touch with people that they love and that they work with, but we need to do this in a way um, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't um, create even more burden on, on the ecology of the planet. So, our goal is to become a much more data-driven and AI-powered telecommunications company. And there's a number of reasons why we have to do that. So first is that in, from the customer's perspective, they really want rich personalization. They want to have great services that are more tailored um, to their needs and their desires. But for our core business, what's happening is that our business is shifting from a business where we 
acquire these boxes from a relatively short list of vendors, and we learn how to integrate those boxes together and manage those boxes. That's being transformed into software, where the software that operates all of these functions to run the network are just on standard hardware. And so that is a really massive shift in both the skills and the way of thinking and the way of working. And at the same time that that's occurring, we have this explosion of data growth um, where you know, everyone wants to watch football matches on, on, uh, on their phone. And so the, the, the demands of sending this kind of video traffic over the network, not to mention these kinds of experiences that we're having right now, um, is really exploding. And, and then if we look at like who our competitors are, uh, we're having new entrants, um, not in France today, but uh, if you look in Japan, for example, um, there's a company called Rakuten, who was a historically was an IT and cloud services provider who acquired the ability to operate a mobile network and is now running 5G networks, um, but with a very, very cloud and data centric approach. And we also see companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft um, providing technology infrastructure that allows uh, many more people to, to enter the market. Um, and so uh, we also have a very um, intense competitive environment. And, but really at the heart, Orange is about the people, the people that we serve as our customers, but also the people who work there. And so if we can better retain those people and empower them to make better and faster decisions where we can use AI to allow them to filter information more, more effectively and focus their workday on the really interesting tasks, the tasks that only a person can do. Um, well, I think will help not only to make this more efficient, but it'll also allow us to, to employees to have to enjoy their workday more. And if we can do all of this, we'll be a lot more agile and efficient and profitable. And that's really critical because on the left, uh, the point there is that we're going to be uh, under ever increasing margin pressure uh, because we have this incredible growth of, of data services. Um, it's expensive and complicated to deploy networks, uh, both fixed line networks and mobile networks. Uh, and so, so the, 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 the business challenge is really significant um, as well as being a cultural uh, shift uh, challenge for the business. So uh, in recognition of all of this, uh, the company every five years has a new strategic plan. Uh, the current one is called Engage 2025. And one of the four pillars of that was to place data and AI at the heart of the innovation model for the whole company. And so we, we, we've got really three key priorities relating to use cases. The first is how to make our network smarter. The second is how do we reinvent the experience that we offer our customers? And then the third is how do we operate the business more efficiently? And as I said before, I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that underneath those three use case domains, we're focused on doing this in a way that's both ethically responsible, but also ecologically sustainable. And uh, you, you'll see that in the use cases that I'll, that I'll show in, in a few minutes. So, so this mission that we have, this Engage 2025 mission, is about how to place data and AI at the heart of the innovation model of the business. And so there's this wonderful mountain of opportunity, mountain of use cases, mountain of potential revenue, mountain of opportunities to make customers happy, but it's actually an iceberg. And so underneath the water, we have this you know, great mountain of use cases and value opportunity, but then underneath the water, there's an enormous part of the iceberg, which is about having much more sophisticated infrastructure and tooling to handle enormous amounts of data at scale. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine how much data is generated um, on a daily basis just by the operation of the network itself, um, not to mention the, the user data that travels over the network. Um, but, but in fact, the biggest part of the iceberg, the base of the iceberg is about culture and skills. And uh, so that, that's really the challenge that we have uh, for the business, transforming it towards 2025 uh, to become more data driven. And this is not easy. So uh, there was a recent uh, MIT study done with Boston Consulting. They interviewed thousands of companies who already had AI projects and teams, and only 11% of them 
said that they generated significant financial benefit from their AI programs. And if you can see here on the slide, the difference is the teams, the companies that used AI to both inform, but also to drive change in their processes. So teams that just used AI to inform certain decisions uh, generated very little value. Whereas ones that had the AI team embedded with an operations team and the operational process itself adapted in response to what the AI was helping the, the, the teams understand, that's where the benefits are. Uh, the good, so that, that's good news is that there's great opportunity and financial benefit from AI. But the hard part is that obviously, the more you get into changing operational processes, the harder it is for your culture to adapt. Um, so this is, this, is, this is a significant challenge. So how are we going to address this? We, the, the first thing at the use case level is be very, very customer centric and value focused. And so what we do now is with the CEO support, identifying the really high impact projects and, and with the CEO's, CEO's help, um, help the teams understand that this opportunity to really drive a change in the business um, is exciting and to give the teams the, the ability to really make significant changes in the operational processes in these different use cases. The second thing is a, is an, is a, is a new uh, is a, is a new kind of phrase that we've invented called data democracy. And, and, and for us, that's about using the very best tools available that preserve data protection and privacy and security, but allow us to break silos. And I'll talk about this in a moment. And so that's on the infrastructure and tool side. And then on the skills and culture point, the way to adapt uh, our culture to be more data-driven is to create these operational teams that have a mix of AI experts with the operational leaders and to encourage them to take risks and to test and learn and to adapt um, as they learn um, throughout the process. So let me talk a bit about data democracy. Um, this is our, our approach, which is a set of tools, but also it's a way of working. And our fundamental challenge is that you probably, many of you in the room probably have this or at home, wherever you are, probably have this challenge yourself where we've got a bunch of data silos that map to organizational silos. So data that's been generated in a particular organization is often held by that same organization. And many times they see, they feel ownership over that data and their perspective is to, to lose control of that data is a loss of power or influence. Um, whereas in fact, the more that data is widely available, uh, the more value we're gonna generate for the whole company. And so we call it a democracy and, and it's not an anarchy. So a democracy is, in, is, a, is, a, is, a, in, is a, a structure that has rules and it has institutions. And if you follow those rules and comply with those institutions, you have a lot of freedom to act. Uh, and so that's how we think about this, this architecture that we're building. So the first point on the data architecture and tooling is how do we make the data available across these silos in a way that, that, uh, that um, uh, protects um, the privacy concerns and security risks? Um, and it also enables quality. And so data ops and data gov ops are two emerging fields that where you use the kinds of methodologies that you use from, from DevOps um, to monitor these processes and maintain quality. The middle is about training and the need to really help people understand why is this valuable and how to use the tools. And then lastly is the, the point I made earlier about uh, the organizational change um, for these teams to operate um, much more in a much more agile way. And just kind of visually for those that in the room that are more technical, the way we're gonna do this is through data lake houses. So for each entity, they'll have their own data lake house. That's a new architecture. That's a, a mix of unstructured and structured data. So a merger of a data warehouse and a data lake. And the team that's generating the data has read and write access to their own data lake house and the others have read access to it. And with this kind of architecture, we can scale very, very, uh, at very, very high scales. Um, we uh, did recently did a deal with Google uh, to enable us to, to, to do this at incredibly high scale on the public cloud. Um, and this ena enables 
uh, the, the team who's generating the data to have still have control of the data and offer their data as a product to other teams, but still allow you to create these use cases that cross these, these organizational silos. I mean, you can imagine the marketing team wanting to know where can, where can I market to people knowing that our network is going to be really strong um, or to run a different kind of campaign to return, to retain customers where the network is not as strong. And so those kinds of use cases are where a lot of the value is based. So we think this will unlock an enormous amount of value in the business. So, so let me talk about some use cases to make it really practical, and then, and then we'll take questions. So the first one, uh, you know, we have operations in 26 countries, many countries in West Africa, and Wolof is a regional language um, spoken in Senegal, but also in a couple of neighboring countries um, like Mauritania. And Interestingly, of the 1.2 billion people in Africa, only 50% of them, less than, less than 50%, speak French, Arabic, or English, which are the languages that most of these uh, AI uh, language um, bots um, understand. And so we have a huge challenge in how do we enable people to speak in the language that they're most comfortable speaking um, to communicate with us and tell us what they need. And so the challenge here with Wolof was that not only was the language uh, a primarily spoken language, it has many sub-regional variants. Um, it was a language that really doesn't have a strong academic, um, uh, a lot of study in terms of its structure. And so, and we didn't have a lot of existing uh, recording, labeled recording of Wolof. Uh, and so it was really incredibly difficult technological challenge that really a lot of the other uh, providers today of, of speech AI weren't addressing. So, uh, so, so we developed this ourselves uh, and it's deployed in Senegal. And the lessons that we learned here on how to do very, very resource constrained, limited language corpora um, uh, languages uh, is really fundamental. And so this one I'm really proud of because it's a great combination of extremely cutting edge research in the field of language AI with the ability to transform the way that we can interact with these customers more efficiently. And that's a win for the customer because they can speak in whatever language they feel comfortable in. And it also is a win for us because uh, many of the problems that they have, we can solve with just the computer interacting with them. So another use case is you know, predicting what products or offers may be really appealing to offer to, uh, to customers. And um, this is a product that we offer uh, in Belgium and France and Romania and Slovakia. And we've had th this again, customers have better NPS. They, they, they appreciate better the, the kind of retail experience interaction they have with us through the website or through the app. Um, but also it drives significant um, revenue for us. Um, and, and, and doing this at scale um, in many different parts of the business is really important to us. And this also applies when people call into the call center, for example, or when you walk into a retail store and you need to service a product. So the ability for us to serve these personalized recommendations all across all of the touch points that we have with our customers uh, is really fundamental to our success and also making people feel like um, uh, Orange uh, is a great provider and, and can recommend things to them that are relevant. And then lastly, um, we, we've done a lot of work uh, to reduce power consumption in our network. And this is a really difficult challenge because as you can imagine, we need to balance between maintaining uh, the quality of the network uh, with power consumption. So. And, and that's very, very dynamic. Um, so what we have now is we have AI that monitors the, the power consumption in every base station. Um, uh, this is in a particular country in Poland. And then we build over time by monitoring how much power is being consumed and mapping it to the amount of traffic. And we can predict uh, over time uh, where we're gonna have uh, power consumption and traffic and not. And so we can turn off base stations um, that aren't needed and reroute traffic without any impact on the quality of the consumer experience. And furthermore, 
the more data that we get from these base stations and we understand their behavior, we can begin to detect anomalies. So for example, um, we can determine what's the root cause of a particular problem in the network. And what's really interesting there is the idea that we can solve problems in the network before the customer ever notices. But also it's really interesting because the computer can recommend corrective actions for the person to take in the network operations center in the center where we're maintaining the network. But even more importantly, when the technician has to go out to the site, if we can tell the technician what's very likely to be the problem in advance of them going, they know what equipment to bring with them. It helps them to prioritize their day. If they know that there's a particularly difficult problem that they have to solve, then maybe they solve that first. So it's been, it's really transformative in terms of the way that we uh, operate the network, both in terms of resiliency, uh, but also in terms of power consumption. So in the case of Poland, we saw 4% decrease in power consumption. And uh, it's even more true now, um, you know, with the, all the current events, um, you know, we're seeing dramatically uh, increased cost to deliver power and, and operate our network. And so the idea that we can make an impact on this um, with AI uh, that doesn't have any impact on the consumer experience, but saves us money, but also is a good thing for the environment um, and also gives us more energy independence in each of our countries uh, is, 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 a, is a huge benefit. So why don't I stop there and take questions? Uh, and if, uh, and so uh, Rafael, why don't you help me to see if there's any questions? Sure. Thanks a lot, Steve. It was a very, very inspired talk, inspiring talk. Uh, so you, we do have indeed uh, some questions uh, uh, that great. came all along your, your talks. I will just voice right. them for the audience to listen to the questions and then hear you answer. So the first one came when you were talking about culture and the audience was asking, how can we pay attention to multicultural requirements and their potentially contradictions that, that occur sometimes? Yeah, it's a great question. So my perspective on that is you need to have teams that are highly multi multicultural. And you know, the, one of the lessons in my career has been that culture, corporate cultures that are highly diverse are much more likely to respond to unexpected events. So it's just like in the real world, just like in the physical world, where if you have an environment of, uh, like a, like a, you know, a, a a, a natural habitat on an island, for example, that's fairly uniform. Um, those those ecosystems they don't react well to unexpected events. So you can have catastrophic failures where you have a much too uniform. Um, uh, you don't have enough diversity uh, in your in your kind of biosystem, and so and it's the true of corporate uh, cultures too. So for me, I, I, we, we we focus really a lot on trying to recruit people, have very different uh, perspectives and backgrounds. Um, my team is spread across many countries already. Um, and, and we have data and AI people in all 26 countries. Um, and so allowing people to, um, to share their perspectives on products is really fundamental. And so, and to do that, you need to have, I think a few things. I, I think, first of all, you need to have a really transparent culture that allows people to share their perspectives. Um, and, and secondly, I think you need to have a culture where you measure. Um, so the ability to, to put um, metrics into your products to measure the success or failure of different um, um, uh, parts of the product that would then allow um, a product team to, to identify there are problems that are only present in a certain country. Um, like, you know, this case with the Wolof language bot, where, you know, there were many customer support interaction failures because people were trying to interact with a bot that had no idea what they were saying. Um, and so I think if you have this kind of mix of transparency with accountability through the um, having really well metric uh, and uh, so you have good observation and tracking of your product, um, then I think you, you, you can adapt and succeed. Um, I think far too many teams um, don't understand the value of uh, having clear uh, metrics of the product to really observe and understand customer behavior. Um, 
and I think you 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 always oftentimes I also see product teams um, kind of they 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 overlook the simple benefit of having a user test the product in front of you. So you know having real users from your different customer segments and countries using the product you know in a lab with you behind a wall observing uh, is just fundamental uh, and you know with just five tests, you can determine whether or not you have a big problem or whether you're on the right path. And, and I think, uh, you know, that's just a really simple lesson, but, but a lot of people forget that, um, you know, it's really hard to replicate that first time user experience, the early user experience without having people who don't know your product uh, to, to, to experience that and for you to observe that. So, so I think those are all ways to solve that problem. Um, but it takes real commitment. Thanks. Uh, meanwhile, we got a wave of new questions. So we'll try to, okay. uh, to be quick and there is quite a lot of, of them coming in. Um, so there is first Juba who is asking, how is it possible to enhance reactivity of services if all departments couldn't write over a data lake? It's when you show the data lake. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let me go back to that so you can see. So, the core data lake house is being written to by each team that's generating data. So like the finance team, for example, they're generating data and pushing it to their data lake house. Um, so they maintain the single source of truth for the generation of that data. And then everybody else in the company can read from it, create a duplicate of the data or uh, act directly on the data, but where the source data remains under the control of the generating team. So. And then new data is generated, uh, you know, downstream data or metadata, um, and that can be that can be um, written back to uh, their own their own location. Um, so uh, but the the basic idea here is you want to enable teams to put their data somewhere that is they feel like is under their control, um, but and where you have observability and you can maintain quality and so on. But where it's it, you don't have these walls silos between the different teams, which is what we see today, not only at, at Orange but also in many many of our B two B customers. Um, you know, th there is this this sort of heritage of that came from having on premise data, where you would generate data, you'd have your own data lake or data storage facility that would be under your control and it was physical machines and you paid for those machines and you maintained them. And the control over that data became part of the influence of your organization. And that way of thinking is really counter to you know, creating value across the company with the, with the data that you have. Um, and so how to do that in a way where the organization still feel like they have control um, and where you can ensure that you've got um, data security and uh, you're, you're doing the appropriate things for data privacy um, is that's the hard part. And so we've been really impressed with um, the innovations that we're seeing, not only from Google, but from many other cloud providers in this domain too. Um, and so the, the, the transformation that we're gonna see um, in Orange and, and, and in our B2B customers by moving to public cloud, uh, we think is gonna be really fundamental um, to our ability to, to, to not only have these data infrastructures that are much more modern and dynamic, um, but also great tooling um, in terms of data security, uh, data obser observation and auditability, but also the AI tool chain as well. I mean, I'm not even talking here about our plans for, 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 for ML ops, for example, and the, and the AI tool chain. But again, um, it's just transformative for our business to have these kinds of tools. That's a good transition to the next questions from um, Ran Sekeda, who is, who is asking, you've been talking a lot about data products and is wondering if your setup is aligned to this new trend of what we call the data mesh. Yeah, so, so, be, so uh, we, we looked at data mesh um, and this, what I'm showing here is kind of our attempt to take the best ideas out of data mesh. So the data mesh concept is that each organization not only generates their own data, but they offer their data as a product to other teams. The problem with that is we don't have enough 
uh, maturity and sophistication in the customer support team, for example, for them to offer their own data as a service to the other teams. So what this architecture is, it's taking that idea of publishing data from you to other organizations, but where it's managed by the data team. So we have the central team of data experts. They set up these data lake houses. They maintain the infrastructure. And then the individual uh, teams like the network team, customer support team, finance team, those are, th those are users of that infrastructure. So for us, this is sort of a, this is a step towards data mesh. I think if we were to look out 10 years uh, and we had very, very sophisticated data teams in each of the organizations, uh, then I think we could potentially migrate in that direction. But um, this is a field where there's enormous investment and innovation. And so um, I expect that this will just continue to evolve. Um, but, but I, but, so I like the idea of data mesh very much, the idea that you publish the data that you've got as a product to other teams. Um, I just think that the level of sophistication isn't high enough yet for each team to do that on their own. That's, it's just, it's too early. Okay, so another question we had is, you, you talk a lot about skills as a, another essential pillars. And so talking about education and skills, Orange has a lot of legacy employees. So the question yes. was wondering, how do they adapt to this data-centric culture, get trained yes. with the appropriate tools and how much internal continuous learning do you need to invest on within the company? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it's, it's one of the most important parts of my job, e even though I'm supposed to be the, the technical architect for dating, I, I'm actually the training person. So uh, what we did is we did a deal with Coursera, who's a really uh, interesting uh, online learning provider uh, based in the United States. They've done deals with lots of leading institutions the founder is um, from Stanford, uh, Andrew Ng. He's one of the best educators in AI. Um, and so they've done deals with leading institutions, not only in the United States, but also all over uh, Europe and Asia, where classes taught by the best professors in their fields are available online. And so uh, we did a deal with them to enable unlimited access to certain parts of their catalog to thousands and thousands of our employees. Um, so that was really the first step was sort of removing the barrier to getting access to the best possible content. Um, that was the first challenge. Um, the second challenge was, which, which is where we are right now, is there's a lot of people that are very comfortable with 100% online learning. There's also a lot of people that really want a kind of classroom experience, even if it's like this over Zoom. And so... We're, we're working right now with potential partners, including Coursera, on how do we do that? How do we give you a classroom experience? Um, kind of like riding on a Peloton bike. How do, we, how do we have that kind of experience where you're learning together, um, where you're supported by experts? Um, and how to do that at scale uh, is a new problem. And so that's what we're focused on right now. Um, the, the other part of the question, I think, though, is about culture change. Um, you know, the, the way we do that is, as I said before, we pick high impact, really interesting use cases that the, at the CEO level, they think are interesting ones. And so the ones that are, that are, um, that are of interest to the, to, the, to the CEO and where we have a team that's really eager to try, we really support those teams. And, and we work with them to then have examples that inspire the other teams that are more conservative to follow. Um, so, you know, at Orange, it's very effective to not only have teams within each country's showing off and trying to, and really trying to uh, compete effectively with one another and who can generate the most value, but it's also really interesting to, to have the countries um, competing with one another. And so we do a lot of sharing both online and then every month we have these review meetings for 90 minutes where people you know, show their best use cases and to, to both inspire uh, the teams that, that maybe aren't sure at first, um, but also to help people discover, hey, which use cases are the ones that are likely to work? Um, and so we've spent a lot of time and energy in tools for sharing the use cases, but also collaboration and, and kind of communication around that. And, and, and it's working. 
um, you know, when we have use cases that that are really impactful, those get the attention of the more conservative teams and the more conservative CEOs over time. Um, but it's a process. And, you know, I think it's not just a 2025 mission. I think that's like a 2030, 2035 <laughs> mission. Um, but, but really, you know, in, inspiring by success. Um, we also really encourage teams to take risks. And we recognize the teams that maybe fail the first one or two times, but recognize and, and congratulate them for pivoting, uh, you know, aggressively and rapidly. Um, and we also, uh, there's really interesting work called customer discovery. Uh, the guy, Eric Reese, who invented uh, Lean Startup, um, he has this approach. Uh, and there's also another person um, uh, named Steve Blank from Stanford University. The two of them have this, this vision of MVPs, but also this idea of customer discovery, where before you even write code, you meet with potential customers and you say, is this valuable? What would you use it for? And they have really interesting sort of trick questions like if the product was free, what would stop you from using it? Or if the product was free, what what else, what other decisions would you have to make to decide whether to deploy it or not? And so that this process of interacting with customers very early in the design process um, to ensure that what you're developing is valuable and useful and you're aligned with the customer's needs, um, that's also helping a lot. Thanks, thanks a lot. And I think we will have just time to take the last question. Uh, Steve, one, one, one final question, it's a good transition because you were talking about impactful use case. And this is the last one, the last slide that has triggered also interesting questions on um, the monetary data about power consumption. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, um, the, the, the questioner says it, it's the first step, but how do you act? What are the implemented decisions today? Are they automatic or human monitored? So how do you yeah. act on this? They're both. So today we have automatic reaction. Um, so we build this predictive model over time and we see when there's uh, when the predictive model uh, determines that we can shut off um, systems. And so the power of shutting off of systems and the redirecting of traffic, that's automatic. Um, it started manual and we built, built confidence in the fact that it worked. Um, we didn't have a consumer uh, impact on quality. And so that's become automated. Um, the detection of anomalies and the root cause analysis, that is manual today. So that alerts a human operator that there's an, an anomaly. We, the computer tells the operator, this is what I think is the, really the problem. Um, and then they investigate. Um, and, and I think that will also potentially move in the direction of more automation there. Um, currently the human, the person, the operator, they determine they confirm that there's a problem, what the problem is and how to fix it. Um, but over time, I think by observing that, the, the, what actions that person takes, uh, the computer can get more and more clever about suggesting the likely action to take, and then maybe even um, reaching a point where the computer's taking the action and the human operator is left to just confirm that what the computer's doing uh, makes sense. Um, I, I think for me, what's really interesting about this is the people in these centers today, in the network operation centers, they are overloaded with false alarms and complex information. So the more that we can focus their attention on the real problems and even giving them suggestions of what they might wanna to do to fix it, it makes their job so much better because there's so many other things they could be doing um, that could be really constructive for the business if they could just focus their time on the obvious, really important problems and not trying to wade through all the avalanche of noise they get today. And that's the, that's the same problem, it's even worse for the field service agents who get called out to go to a site in the field and they get there and have no idea what to expect and they find, oh my God, this is gonna take me two days to fix. Um, and so like giving them advanced understanding of what to expect makes their life a lot easier too. Thanks. Thanks uh, again a lot, Steve, for uh, for this very, very interesting talk. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank also all the attendees um, who have stayed uh, um, all, all this day long. Yeah, uh, so let's do it's again a virtual day. applause for Steve. 
My pleasure. And, 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 and we're hiring in every every of the 26 countries. So if any of you are interested in in in, uh, in, in joining this great mission we've got, we're very welcome to, we're very happy to talk to you. Thanks. So this closed today's um, scientific program. Um, and well, um, the web conference will resume now tomorrow at 9 uh, a.m. Uh, CEST. So thanks again and have a good end of the day. Bye-bye.